Amen. Glad everyone's here today. Welcome to the Lord's house. Amen. David said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. I, I, I don't know about you, but I like coming here. I like being around God's people. Amen. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And that's just not today, folks. That's every day. Amen. All right. This morning, we are going to open our Bibles and start the service off with the reading of God's holy word. I'd like you to stand with me. We're going to be reading 1 Corinthians 15. 12 through 17, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 17. Lord's been good. I tell you, I cannot complain a bit, even though the snow was pretty heavy down here. I had zip up north. <laughs> Not a thing. I saw a robin this morning, too, praise the Lord. Amen. So that's a good thing. Uh, in fact, that I just pulled in the driveway, and he was sitting right there looking at me. So I said, thank you, Lord. That's a good sign. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how some say among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. For And your faith is also vain. Yea, and he found a false witnesses of God, because you have, we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not, for if the dead rise not, then is Christ is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. But we know the difference that Christ did raise from the grave. And we are no longer in our sins because of it. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you, Almighty God, for this scripture, Lord. Father, the world wants to teach us that you don't exist and it never happened. But God, we are standing here today living proof that you love us, dear God. You died for us. And he rose again that third day. What an amazing uh, fact, dear God, that we can bask this morning in. And we pray, Almighty God, that you're part of this worship service. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us this morning, dear Father, to actually reach out to you, Father, that we would please what you what we do here, what pleases you, God. We thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'll tell you what, when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we ought to look at something very carefully. That the world doesn't see it the way you see it. And it is amazing to us. I hope it's amazing to you. This is supernatural, folks. What we're doing, what we're worshiping is supernatural. It's bigger than us. You're part of something much bigger than you. And when we be a part of the worship service and we're singing songs about that amazing grace, listen, John got it. John Newton got it back in the, when he was alive. If we can get it today, it'll be sweeter every day. Amen. And it's about that resurrection. Why? It's because he rose from death. It's because we, we believe that with all our heart that we're saved. You believe that. You believe part of the salvation. Man is believing me. He rose from the dead. Amen. What a blessing to have that in our hearts. To, listen, folks. If he doesn't live, just like we read, it's all in vain. It's all at not. Folks, he's alive. It's real. Heaven is real. Hell is real. The problem is the world don't, don't see it the way you see it. You know what we want to do? Is get them to see the same thing you see. Amen? That's why we give the gospel. Amen? And we have a new memory verse. Uh, we didn't get a chance to say the old memory verse, so we're going to do it right now. Romans 12, 1 and 2. If anybody knows it, obviously it's not written in here, so you have to say it from memory. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Amen. Hopefully you guys got it. All right, now we have a new memory verse, 1 John 5, 13, which I believe is very, very important for the saint of God to know. Why do I say that? I'll tell you why. It's because a lot of people say, uh, you know, if you're going to heaven when you die, they say, I hope so. You memorize this verse. You give them this verse then they can know so. So let us read 1 John 5.13. It's our memory verse for the month. You have four weeks to get it down. 1 John 5.13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5.13. Praise the Lord for the Word of God. Amen. Lord's been good. I tell you what, but that raising from the dead kind of sealed the deal for me. I don't know about you. Uh, when I found out that my Savior died for my sins, and I know that for a fact that he died for me personally because of my sin, and he went to that cross personally for me, 
Folks, I'm telling you, that's when it all made a difference to me. The Lord stopped by and said, I forgive you, Jim. One of the greatest days of my life. Why is that? Because I was a sinner. I was a sinner. I was saved by the grace of God, amen, and the blood of Jesus Christ. This, uh, these next few weeks, I want to be really focusing and drilling in on that cross, that crucifix this morning. I want to just, uh, just give the Lord praise for everything he's doing, amen? What a blessing it is. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll look at a few things here that the Word of God has revealed to us through the Word of God. And Aren't you glad you have a Bible? Amen. I tell you, without it, we wouldn't know any of this stuff. Hallelujah. We wouldn't know anything that God has for us. We wouldn't even know about this resurrection that we share. Amen. Folks, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 1 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellent of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. First, And look at verse number 18 in 1 Corinthians. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Father, thank you, God, for that power. Thank you, Lord, Father, that we actually can see the power manifested every single day. Help me, dear God. Help me this morning, dear Lord Jesus, to preach this, to preach you crucified. Father, for it is the power. Thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do. Bless these folks, Lord. Open their hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The preaching of the cross is called the power of God to us. That's what the preaching. To the lost, it's called foolishness. Why are you talking about the cross? Why are you preaching about the cross? In fact, it's foolishness to them to a point they don't even come to church, obviously. It doesn't mean nothing to them. And if the cross meant something to you, you'd do something about it. You'd actually do something about what he did for you so many years ago. If you've been saved here for a little while, you know what the difference is. You've been saved for a long time. You know what the difference is. The power of the cross is power to us. It's making something alive that was dead. The foolish say we believe in a fairy tale, a myth, they might say. I stand here today proclaiming the power of God. In 1 Corinthians 1, 23, the Bible says, But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks, foolishness. What are the Jews? The Jews don't believe in the resurrection. Judaism doesn't even look at the New Testament. The Greeks, they're philosophers. They think it's all foolishness. It's the church of God, those that believe Jesus Christ died and rose again the third day, for your sins, and you took it personally. Now, that's the church. That's what we're talking about here. But to us, it is power. We preach Christ crucified. Why? Because it's a power. Verse 24 says, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Do you know that the power of God and the wisdom of God rests in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's why we are here. Verse 25 it says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. With God and nothing, you're a majority. With Christ and nothing, you have it all. You need no more. Christ crucified. The word cross of Christ often speaks in scriptures 28 times in the New Testament, the word cross occurs. Uh, the cross is a symbol of redemption. We have one behind us. It's a symbol that we all can see and look at. It is also an instrument of execution. A lot of people have crosses on their necklaces. It represents redemption. It represents what he did. It reminds the one, the wearer, that... He died on that cross for you. And by the way, our cross is empty. He ain't up there. He's off there. He's in us. It's a sign of forgiveness. Amen. He's in us. It's a memorial, a moment in time that the wrath of God was poured out on his son. It's what the Lord commanded us to pick up and carry. Charles Spurgeon said something. 
He said that there are no crown wearers in heaven who wear not cross bearers below. There are no crown bearers in heaven who were not cross bearers below. He said, pick up the cross and follow him. Folks, how many know that cross is heavy? That cross is painful. That cross is what killed Christ. This time is often remembered as with his birth. In fact, all of mankind's time in history was separated by his birth, B.C. and A.D. But all humanity is separated by the resurrection. All humanity is separated by the resurrection. Those that accept and those that reject. How many know those three crosses on the hill of Calvary? One on the right and one on the left. What you're looking at is the cross of Jesus Christ, and you're looking at those that accept and those that reject. One's in heaven today, and the other's in hell still. Kind of makes you wonder. That's a picture of, what? why three crosses? That's a picture of all humanity. You have Jesus, you have those that accept Jesus, and those that do not. Let's read some of the, the scripture here. We're going to read a little bit of scripture here. You might get your Bible reading in for today. Go with me to uh, Mark chapter 14, please. Mark chapter 14, we're going to read quite a bit of scripture. I want to read the entire story of what happened during this event. Um, I want to acquaint you with the Lord's inspiration to Mark about what happened and what he saw that you could see, and it basically recorded for you and I to look at. And by the way, it's in the other Gospels too, but this particular one has some some added one added added features in it that you might find interesting. So we in in Mark 14 look at verse 53. We'll start in Mark 14 and verse number 53. Uh, this is right after Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane. We all know what happened in that garden. And he was praying if this cup be, uh, if I don't have to take this cup, Lord, please take it from me. You know, he knew. He knew he had to take it. Uh, he, that's where he sweat drops of blood. And by the way, folks, that's real. That can happen. Uh, he was very, very much sorrowful for this. But at the same time, he was glad it was going to happen. Verse 53. And when they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes, and Peter followed him afar off, even unto the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and all the council sought for a witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. Uh, for many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there were all certain and bear false witnesses against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. But the high, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it that which these witnesses against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the blessed, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and the coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and says, What need we any further witness? We have heard the blasphemy. What think he? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to buffet him, and say unto him, Prophesy, and thy servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. And as that Peter was uh, beneath the, in the palace, there come out one of the maids of the high priest. And when he, he saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, uh, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand. I know thou what thou sayest. And he went into the porch, and the cock crew. And the maid saw him again, and began to say, that, that stood by, this is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after that, they stood by and said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art the Galilean. And thy speech agreeeth thereunto. But he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom you speak. And the second time the cock crew, and Peter called the mind of the word that Jesus said to him before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And we thought of thereon, he wept. Verse chapter 15. 
And straightway in the morning the chief priest had consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered, said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answer thou nothing? Behold, how many things thy witness against thee? But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. And now at the feast he uh, released unto them one prisoner whom they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder and in, in, in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. And Pilate answered and saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered them for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then I shall do unto him? Ye shall call the king of Jews. And they all cried out, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to contend with the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus. And we had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall and called the Praetorium. And they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon his head. And he began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him in the head with a reed and did spit upon him. And bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put on his own clothes and led him to be crucified. And they compelled one Simon of Cyrene, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the palace of Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. And they gave him to drink and wine mingled with mirth, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments and casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of the accusation was written over the king of the Jews, and with him that crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads, saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest in three days, Save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise awful the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, because himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him rivaled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Emeli, Salabaka, Salatana, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he called Elias. And one ran to fill the sponge of vinegar and put it in a reed, and he gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come and take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain in the top and bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out, and he gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking afar off, whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, uh, uh, the less of jo Joas and Solomon, who, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many others, other women which came up uh, with him into Jerusalem, and now when even was come, become, because it was preparation, that day was the day before the Sabbath. Joseph uh, the Armenian of the Honorable Council, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly on the pallet and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled, if he were already dead, and calling unto the centurion, he asked whether it had been, uh, had been any while dead. And when he knew of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And for he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in linen and laid him in the sepulcher, which was hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of, of Joseph, beheld where he was laid. Verse chapter 16. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of James and Solomon, also had brought sweet spices that they might 
uh, come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher and raising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, for they saw a young man sitting at the right hand, clothed in the long white garment, and they were affrightened. And he said to them, Be not affrightened, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where he laid him. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that you goeth before to Galilee. There shall you see him. And he said unto you, And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they were trembled and were amazed, and neither were they anything any man, for any were afraid. And now when Jesus was risen, in the early first day of the week, he appeared uh, first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom the, he had cast seven devils. And he, she went and told them, and went, had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive, and had been seen of her, believed not. And after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked, and they went into the country. And they went and told and, and unto the residue, neither believed them, they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, they sat meat and upbraided them and, and for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them, which when he had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And this sign shall follow uh, them that believe in my name, and they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with a new tongue, and they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any, any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then the Lord hath spoken unto them that he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And they went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. That's a story. I'm telling you right now, that right there is what we preach. It said in verse 15, Go unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What is preach? What is preaching? Glad you asked. Preach is to proclaim, to make known by sermon, the gospel, the good tidings, to advocate the moral truth, the right conduct in speech, and writing to give earnest advice. That's what preaching is. And we preach Christ crucified. The gospel of Jesus Christ includes the cross, nails, and an empty tomb. To remember Jesus is to remember, first of all, his cross. John Knox said that, the author of Amazing Grace. Spurgeon said, nothing provokes the devil like the cross. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1, I believe we read that this morning. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which are also ye have received, where ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, which I had received, how that Christ died for your sins, according to the scripture. And he was buried... And he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. My friends, if you didn't have the scripture, we wouldn't know that. It's because of the scriptures that we understand what happened at Calvary. And all of this had to happen. Why? For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. My friends, it had to happen because we serve a just God, a righteous God. And a just God and righteous God demands righteousness. And your sin and my sin had to be paid for one way or another. We either paid for it with our own body, soul, and spirit in hell, or one other that was perfect paid for it at Calvary. Mercy is given to all humanity. Every day we exist another day, God has bestowed mercy upon us. Mercy was given collectively at the cross of Calvary when Jesus asked his father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's mercy to all of mankind, including the lost. If a lost person is alive today and breathing, they are experiencing the mercy of God. When grace is applied, 
It becomes personal. It becomes personal to the individual that accepts the payment that Christ paid for his or her individual life. I've said this before. There's not a single person in hell right now there for their sins. Because at Calvary, it was paid for, past, present, and future. What are they there for, preacher? They're there because they rejected the payment of that sin, that payment of blood, that redemption that happened at Calvary. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and rose again. That's what they reject. That's why they're in hell. Romans 3, 24, the Bible says, being justified freely by his grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier to him that believeth in Jesus. Justified means just as if you have never sinned. That's what he did for you and I. Only for those which believe in Jesus. What does the cross do for us? Number one, it declares his love despite our hate. Despite our sin. Despite our rejection. The cross declares his love for all humanity. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When he was on that cross, that blanket mercy went out to the entire world, past, present, and future. When we turn and look at the cross, we ask the Lord to forgive us. And one of the ways salvation comes is when you recognize you belong on that cross. The thief on the right recognized this. He recognized that a just man was being crucified. And he, an unjust, was getting what he deserved. Folks, that's recognizing salvation. When you recognize what you deserve and that he took it for you, that's called salvation. In Luke 23, 39, the account of the thief and one of the malefactors who were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive due reward for our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, listen to these words, Lord, remember me, when thou comest to thy kingdom. And listen to what Jesus said. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. When we see the Lord and name him as Lord, God looks at your heart. That's when salvation comes. When you recognize, when, when Paul was on the ground looking up, persecuting the Christians, he was persecuting the Christians, the believers. And Jesus said, Paul, Saul, Saul, why thou persecute me? Do you know what Paul recognized at that point? That Jesus was God. And the church was Jesus. Because who was he persecuting? He didn't touch Jesus. He, was, he didn't crucify him. He's, crucify, he's touching the church. Jesus put him and the church together. And Paul recognized that. God saw his heart. How is important that to us, all of us? It shows the example how we must be born again. That's how you are born again. Romans 10, 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, Lord, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. No, that thief never saw him raised from the dead. But he knew. Why? He said, Lord. And Jesus said to him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know what he did? Jesus literally told him, hey, I'm the Savior. I'm the dying, but you'll see me again. I'm going to raise from the dead. You know what that thief saw? The thief saw the dying Jesus and called him Lord. And then the dying Jesus called him and said, you'll be with me in paradise. That's what happened to you when you found Jesus Christ. When you saw Christ on the cross and he paid for your sins and you called him Lord. 
He saw your heart and he said to you for today, from now on, if you die, you'll be with me in paradise. Now paradise was in the ground. It's up in heaven now. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. Where is he? He's at the right hand of God. If there was no resurrection, there's no salvation. If there is no cross, there's no payment of sin. No acknowledgement, no belief, no paradise, no heaven. Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what the thief did. He said, Lord. That's what you did. You said, Lord. Do you know what the thief does? The thief does? He steals. He steals things that don't belong to him. That's what thieves do. Do you know that the devil is a liar and a thief and wants uh, this world to doubt this very event that we just read about? We read three chapters almost. We read about this. You know, they have what they call the swoon theory. They says, oh, he was just in the cool of the, the cave. He, he just, uh, he didn't really die. That The coolness raised him from the dead and he walked out. Not realizing that every drop of blood he had was left at that Calvary. There's a hallucination theory. That means that 500 people that saw him were on acid. There's the impersonation theory. I like to see the guy, you know, the guy that impersonated him, I like to see the holes in his hand. And there's the thief theory. The disciples stole his body. He, they just claimed he rose. In fact, in Matthew 28, 11, it, it gives you detail about this theory of the theft. It says, and now when the, they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed them the chief priest all the things that were done. Can you imagine what they were thinking? Verse 12, and when they assembled with the elders and taking counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away, they sleep. And if this come to the governors, we will persuade him and secure you. So guess what they did? They took the money, and they did as they were taught, saying, and it is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. Who's the real thief and liar? Devil. Okay, who authorized this? In the last hundred years, new versions have removed what we read this morning, Mark 16, 9 through 20. Or they have let the reader know this doesn't belong in Scripture. There's a footnote. They remove Mark 16, 9 through 20, which begins with the words, as Jesus risen. Of 620 copies of manuscripts, two, uh, 618 contain this, these verses, 9 through 20. Only two, the Vaticanus and the Sadius, don't have it. Over 100 different writers quote these verses in Scripture before 300 A.D., 1st and 2nd century. Proof that they belong. Who would want you to doubt this event? Who would want you to read those comments at the bottom of those Bibles that say these don't really belong here? I want you to know the truth. The Bible says search the scriptures. And verse 9 begins with, Now when Jesus was risen. That's what we preach. That's our foundation. Christ crucified, was buried, and rose again. The world doesn't want you to believe that. Psalms 11.3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundation of the crucifix is attacked every single day. Oh, they will celebrate it here in a few weeks. Call it Easter Sunday. Everybody will wear a new dress. They'll have a new hat. Uh, pastel colors everywhere. Bunnies will be abound. There'll be all kinds of Really strange things. They'll have a holiday called Good Friday. Nowhere in the Bible does it talk about that. Nowhere in the Bible does it talk about the things that the world's about to celebrate. The strange thing about it is they don't even believe it's true. The odds of the Bible prophecy concerning Jesus Christ's death and burial and resurrection uh, not being true are one and one hundredth quadrillion. 
That's impossible odds. It's true. Man has theorized himself right into hell. Folks, God is real. Heaven is real. And if it's not real, we are all in trouble. And not to believe this book in the event is just plain suicide, if you ask me. It's the self-destructive behavior is the reason that Christ came in the first place. When we look at the cross and we see what happened, we see what he did for us personally, no wonder when, when uh, John Newton penned Amazing Grace, he said, Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul, like Paul says, the wretched man that I am. He recognized it to save that which was lost. Folks, we lost it in Genesis. We regain it in Revelation. To do that, God's son had to pay. God cannot be around sin. The wage has been paid at Calvary. I believe someone mentioned here today that Satan was struck down at Calvary. He was defeated at Calvary. Sin was defeated at Calvary. It was paid for completely. No more. No more does it have a should or have, will have effect on you as a believer in Jesus Christ. Sin doesn't have to rule and reign. If you do, if you sin, thank God for 1 John 1, 9, but it's not ruling and reigning over you sin because of choice. Because you chose it. John Newton not only penned, penned the great words of amazing grace, he penned this poem. Listen to the words that he wrote looking at that cross. He says, In evil long I took delight, unawed of shame or fear, till a new object struck my sight. I'd stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood, who'd fixed his languid eyes on me, as near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins, his blood and split, and helped to nail him there. Alas, I knew not what I did, but now my tears are vain. What shall my trembled soul be hid for I, the Lord, have slain. A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for ransom paid. I died that thou may live. Thus, while his death my sin displays in all its blackest hue, such is the mystery of grace. It seals my pardon too. With pleasing grief and mournful joy, my spirit now I'd fill that I should such a life destroy, yet live by him I killed. He recognized what he did. He saw what he did at Calvary. And what he did is he put Jesus on that cross. That's why he sings and wrote and penned Amazing Grace. If you don't know the story of John Newton, I recommend you read it. He was a slave owner, drove a slave ship. God miraculously saved him out of that sin. Folks, what we have is a miracle. You, if you believe in Jesus Christ here today, are a walking miracle. Because that cross doesn't mean the same thing to everybody as it should mean. We preach Christ crucified. When we preach Christ crucified, all of a sudden things are different. We gave up on the world, and we looked to Christ. We gave up on the world's ways, and we looked to God's ways. That's what that spirit inside you, that Holy Spirit, is doing for you today. It's allowing you to be a follower of Christ, a believer in Christ. It's allowing you to go to heaven and not hell. Hallelujah. Why? For you called upon the Lord that one day, and you asked him to save you. You surrendered everything you had for him. If you're saved here today, your home is in heaven. If you're lost here today, you're like that thief that's in hell today. And that will be your home. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friend, have you surrendered your will to God's will?
Father, we ask you, Almighty God, to be with us. Lord, help us, dear Lord Jesus, as we go about our work and day of, of the day, dear Lord, that we would preach the gospel, preach Christ crucified. Father, I pray if there's anybody here lost and undone without you, I pray, Almighty God, you'd help them to get saved. I pray if there's anybody here that's listening to these words, God, and does not know you personally, Father, I pray they surrender today. They surrender to you, dear God. They surrender to the cross, to the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Father, that they might believe and be saved. Father, my prayer is that all would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Father, we preach crucifixion. We, pre we preach that you rose from the dead. Father, that you might prove what you said was true. We're asking you, Almighty God, to be with us this morning. Help us, dear God, to do your will, your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, when you surrendered all to him, when you got saved, that wasn't just the only thing you had to surrender. You know, he wants you to surrender everything that you have to him. He wants you to give him everything you own. He wants to chart, take over everything you have, your body, soul, and spirit. Why? That you might live again. Friends, I'm telling you right now, that resurrection is real. And you need to surrender to self and give it to him. When it says, I surrender all, it's not some, it's everything. Are you thinking of other things today? Is there something that's causing you not to think of what he did for you? My friend, surrender to him. Father, we thank you, Almighty God, for what you're about to do here today. Lord, I pray for the hearts and minds of all those here today, God. I pray you'd help them, God, get through this day. One day at a time, you promised, God. Father, we just take this day and we'll use it for you. I pray, Almighty God, that you bless each and every soul that heard these words. Father, as we preach you crucified these next few weeks, as we look to the cross and we look to the death, the burial, and the resurrection, I pray it means more to us today than it did yesterday. And Father, I pray we stand on it today. I pray, Almighty God, we go and teach and preach the gospel to every creature. And we'll thank you for it and give you praise and glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.